What a beautiful piece to remind us of the character of God, which is really what our focus this morning is from our passage in James chapter 1. I hope you've been enjoying our study as we uh, will march through this book through the summer. It will be a great opportunity for us to see what the Lord is going to do in speaking to our hearts. And James has been encouraging us to have wisdom, to be wise giving us uh, information and giving us a way of living for us to know how to be effective in the world that the Lord has placed us in. So I've been encouraging you to be reading this book every uh, day. I hope some of you have taken up that request. I'm going to encourage some of you that may have not started that. We still have many more weeks to go. So I want to encourage you to take the opportunity, even this afternoon, uh, by taking the time and reading this book. And I believe the more you read it and the more you hear the repetitive part of the scriptures in your heart and your soul, the Lord will give you even greater understanding as you hear uh, sermons preached from this at the same time. So I hope you'll take me up on that opportunity. But uh, today I'm going to change things up. I'm going to pray right now before we start. You normally see me pray after the scriptures, but last week when I did that, the band from the second service thought I was finished, so I'm going to do the prayer at the beginning, um, and we will... And I may have to announce that every time I pray. But here we go. Oh, Lord, we are grateful for your majesty and your glory and your power are clearly seen in our world and in us. And, Father, we thank you that we can live through this world, even in the quiet of the storm that we have in our life. We are able to see the sun shining, and there are times when we have struggle and difficulty. And through your gift of your word, through James, we are reminded that we are a people that when we know you, we can consider it all joy, even in the midst of our trials and our tribulations. And it's hard for us to comprehend, but we are reminded of your character, of your love for your people, that you are able to even do something good in the midst of our trials and tribulations even when we can't understand or won't have the answer to our whys. But Lord, we thank you that you bring comfort to those that are hurting. And so today we know that some have come into, these, into this building, into this sanctuary with trials all about them and trouble has followed them. And Father, we pray that you would give them the ability to persevere and lead them to turn to you and pray and ask for wisdom and you will give to them generously. And for those of us who are basking in the sunny days and in the quiet of the storm, I ask you to help us remember your goodness and to remember you, that we need you every hour. We need you every day. And to remember that the peace and calmness in our life is a blessing and a gift that comes down out of heaven from you to us. So we thank you for the hope that you give to us, that not only in this world can we have hope, but even a greater hope for the world that is yet to come, the crown of life that is now ours because of Christ doing his work on our behalf. May you guide our hearts to give us greater understanding of your word this morning and help for our journey along the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I look back over my lifetime and my ministry experience, I realize that I've had many highs and lows, which I'm sure any one of you could come up here and say the exact same thing. And I want you to understand that the Lord has used all of that in my life to bring me to even to this point in my life today, as I look at what the Lord has been doing. But it began back in a a uh, time when I went to a Bible college just after I graduated from high school. I went to a Bible college in Scroon Lake, New York, just outside of Lake Placid. And I had been encouraged by my brother to go there and take a year off before I would go pursue my career, which I was looking uh, to do in sports. And so as I spent time at that little Bible institute and heard great preachers from around the United States, the Lord began to call me into the ministry. I began to see that the things that I had put first place in my life were things that I had made idols out of. And I've shared with you many times that sports became one of my idols. I loved rugby more than I loved God. 
And the Lord used this Bible Institute to start telling me that my heart was an idol factor, and it began to show me that I had made some things in my life more precious than God. And the Lord began to reveal those to me. And he drew me to the idea of full-time ministry. Now, I was a pastor's kid, and so I never had the pressure from my dad or my mom uh, to be going into the ministry. But as I was there in that... uh, beautiful location, I will tell you that much, and enjoying and seeing how the Lord was working in my life, I felt the Lord was calling me to ministry, and that began the journey. I went off to college to try to prepare and uh, find an undergraduate degree. I went in American Studies, which was history, law, and politics, and the professors that I had in that small college campus in the Midwest, in Ohio, were professors that had a strong understanding of Christian faith and what it meant to apply it in everyday life. So every day I was in class, and these professors were encouraging me to think Christianly about life to think about my vocation and how I could be serving the Lord. They helped develop my Christian worldview. And I look back at my college days and see how the Lord had placed certain professors in my life for that very purpose. And I sought friends and mentors to help me along the way. But being in a Christian college, one of the things that became very clear, there were those who truly believed in God and there were those that weren't following God. It was easy to fake it, and so there were many kids there that their parents had uh, shipped them off to a Christian college with the hope that they would uh, carry on the Christian faith, but it was very easy sometimes to find the false reality of many walking on the campus of our Christian school. And so all that did was then begin to tell me that I wanted something real. I wanted something that would help me persevere and endure all the way through to the end. So as I saw some of the fake followers of Christ, all it did was drive me deeper to learn the scriptures more and to make sure that I wouldn't fall into that kind of relationship with the Lord. I wanted something deeper and something more meaningful. My journey was long and slow, but I wanted it quick and fast. I wanted it according to my ways, and God had a plan that was far different than I was expecting. I was Canadian, so I had to stay home and work for many years in order to make enough money to go back to the United States. So it took me 10 years from the moment that I felt the Lord was calling me into ministry. 10 years later, I entered into the ministry because the Lord had a different plan. And all during those 10 years of ministry, up and down, up and down. After my college experience, I had the opportunity to go to seminary in Orlando, Florida, at Reformed Theological Seminary. And in the middle of my studies there, my father passed away. I was in my mid-twenties. My dad was someone who was very precious to our family, sort of the hub of the wheel, if you want to think about it for that perspective. And so I then had to deal with the loss of my dad and wondering about how how things were going to work now. What was life going to look like? He was an influence that I really felt as the baby in the family that I didn't have enough time with my dad. I felt that there, I, I was short-suited. I felt, Lord, why would you allow this to happen? I had the ambition that the Lord would allow my dad to live long enough to see me graduate from seminary, to have him hear me preach my first sermon. Those were the desires of my heart, but the Lord didn't have that as part of the plan. And so I had to wrestle with that. I had to wonder why. I was wondering what would God allow this to happen with me at this kind of age and And I wanted so much more and to have that removed. What was the Lord doing in my life? And there was times that I doubted God's goodness. There were times where I wondered, if God is for me, I didn't believe it. And there were days that I wondered what was going on. And yet, I continued to see how the Lord had used different professors, different people, even my father, in preparing me for what I would go through and experience. God was at work in these trials and tribulations, perfecting me and reminding me that in the days to come, this crown of life that James talks about in chapter one would be mine. That the understanding of knowing that there's gonna be struggle in this world, but there is a day coming when that struggle will be finally over and God wins. So shortly after my ministry experience. I went to school, and after my dad had passed away, I met my wife, and there I fell in love. 
And we got married, and we see that as a, one of God's gifts to us as we begin to start looking at the character of God. And I can look back and see all these wonderful things that the Lord did in my life and how the Lord had blessed me with parents, had blessed me with my wife, and now a uh, ministry that the Lord had been calling to me. And we went back to Toronto to be a church planter with the denomination that I was ordained in. Now, my first ministry experience was awful. It was a, quite a difficult experience being a church planter with co-pastors, and so uh, we were there to plant another church. But I will tell you, the experience that I had working uh, with the team was very difficult and challenging. The leader of our team said that it was his desire that he would break me because that would make me the best person I could be for God's work. So he continued to try almost every day to break me, to try and tell me that I'm not good enough, to try and tell me all my faults and all my failures. He'd point them out. If I preached, he would not tell me anything good about the sermon. He would tell me everything that was wrong with the sermon. He would even talk about the words that I would use, the poor grammar that I might employ, all the different things that were there. Or he'd say, well, where did you get that information? I don't think you could get that out of that passage. That was the type of experience that I would go daily. If attendance was low on Sunday, I didn't want to go in on Monday because I knew that I would be blamed for the low attendance. And that was the struggle, and it was constantly, he would tell me over and over again, I am going to break you. Because once I do, then you'll be used the best for the Lord. Well, I would go home on a regular basis, and my wife will attest to this, and I would tell her, I don't know if the Lord wants me in the ministry anymore. I just can't believe that this is what it's going to be like. Maybe the Lord is using this man to tell me this is not what I should be doing for the rest of my life. And there were days that I could have gone home very depressed and very discouraged. I was and yet the Lord was able to continue to help me have encouragement. There were people that he sent into my life, even as my dad was now passed away, Alyssa's father became one who I could seek counsel from. And he would encourage me and tell me, look, Sheldon, you're getting what you are having in this experience, what men will get in the middle of their ministry years, and they will walk away from the church. And he said, for some reason, the Lord is having you have this at the beginning of your ministry, and he's preparing you. And he would tell me, you need to buck up. He would tell me, I need to have rhino skin so that when I would hear the things that he would say, that I wouldn't allow it to penetrate and make me think that my uh, worth is based on what this man thought it would be. And so he had to encourage me to have a different understanding. And he, through that, the Lord was gracious. The Lord was good. And even the words that were said there, and I can still remember the very words there. So I began to see that the Lord was even using that experience and that difficulty in ministry to prepare me for what was ahead. And every time I have gone on to a different form of ministry, I realize how the Lord has used what has gone on in the past, the trials and the tribulations, have been things that he would use to help perfect me and mold me into what he wanted me to be in the ministry. And I can come here to Cornerstone and say, even the things that I've experienced here, the chaos that we've had for the many years, is nothing in comparison to what I've experienced in the past. This is actually a lot lighter. So I have shared with many of the sessions saying, look, don't worry, this is nothing in comparison. The Lord has, again, prepared me for different things, and I'm grateful for how the Lord has worked through all of those trials and tribulations because he was accomplishing something good in me and reminding me of his character and as we heard the choir just sing that beautiful anthem, the reminder of his majesty and glory, those are the things that we are able to hang on to when we experience trials and tribulations in our life. God gave me hope when I was distraught, when I experienced the, uh, the disability, the difficulty in ministry, when I saw all of that happening, the Lord was always there to meet me. The Lord was always there alongside of me. And even when I cried out, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? He may not have given me the direct answer, but he showed me over time that he was doing this for my good. 
and I could look to his power, I could look to his love, I could look to his character and trust him that he was going to do good in my life, even though the evil one would speak into my ear and try to tell me otherwise. Well, James is trying to tell you the exact same thing. This chapter is a wonderful chapter for you to come and explore and dive into. So that's why I want to encourage you to read it. This is a passage of scripture that I come to when I do get discouraged, when I do get distraught. Romans 8 and James 1 are things that are flagposts in my mind of things that I turn to to help me, to remind me of the character of God. James wants you to know the same God. He wants you to understand his power and his glory and his goodness to you, and you should never doubt it. So James says this, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to James chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And here in these three little verses, the Lord unfolds for us his character and reminds us of who he is and something that we can hold on to. James does not want you to be deceived or allow your mind to wander to begin to think that the things that have happened in your life, the evil that you've been able to uh, see encroach into your life, that God is the author of that evil in your life. James is not giving you that opportunity. He wants to correct your understanding. He wants to give you a good perspective of who God is. He does not want want you to believe that God would do good, um, do evil in your life and your trials and tribulations can be used to accomplish the greatest things in your life. He's perfecting us and molding us into something better. You can imagine the people who received this letter in the first place. Remember, the audience that he wrote to were Christians who were being forced out of Jerusalem because they were followers of Jesus Christ. They were people who were being put to death. This is an encouragement that he gives to people who are fighting off the persecution and trying to save their lives for following Jesus Christ. And we sit there and think about that kind of reality, and James speaks these words into their minds to remind them that God is good, because some of the people that he was writing to doubted that. Some of them were wondering if all of this could be true. Could God be good enough to be able to use this in my life? Can, doesn't God tempt us? Doesn't he bring evil into our life? That's what he's trying to correct in the verses that we looked at last week. And so he comes back again to tell you, no, that is the wrong perspective if you believe God is doing this for your worst and for bringing you and destroying you. And some of us have that view of God ourselves, that we believe that God is not on our side. He's out to bring karma to your life for what you've done wrong. And the many people I've visited in the hospital, in their hospital beds, maybe facing death, who felt that the Lord was doing this to punish them and trying to help them understand the proper perspective of God. James is doing that for us. He wants you to understand that we shouldn't doubt God's goodness in the middle of our trials and tribulations and our troubles. We should understand that he's going to be the one that will help us persevere. He's the one who's offered to us a crown of life for the future. He's the one that can even make joy be in the midst of our tears and in our struggle. He is the one that enables us to have that way and to think that God is tempting us and leading us to evil Jesus corrects us in the Lord's prayer and reminds us that the Lord is on our side and reminds us that, yes, life is going to have many disappointments. There's going to be brokenness. There's going to be ruin that we're going to experience in this world, but that never allows us to lose hope. Because when we begin to ponder on the greatness of God and his goodness for us, it does bring us joy and it gives us that hope. We need to remember who God is. And we need to remember what he has done in this world and the joy that we can now have 
There's power in God's work. There is the display of his holiness in our life and in the work that he will do among us. And so we will experience trouble all around us. Trouble will visit our marriages. Trouble will visit our workplace. Trouble will meet us on the schoolyard. And there is no, no door that we can shut that will keep trouble out. But for those of us who follow Jesus Christ and put our trust in him, we know that God's goodness is in the midst of trouble. So life has its disappointments. It may meet us with loneliness. It may lead us into brokenness. But we need to remember who God is. That's what James wants us to understand this morning, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. So when I look over the journey of my lifetime and I see the trials and tribulations, I also hunt for the good that I'm able to see that God did in my life. And so I want to encourage you to do the same. Hunt for the good because you'll find it. Search and you will see that the Lord has been with you and will carry you along. No matter how dark the darkness gets over your life, no matter how stormy it may be, God is good. And James wants you to remember this, that every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father in heaven to you and to me. And then he goes on, if you don't think that's good enough, remember the type of person that he is. He is one that does not change. He's the father of lights. He's the one who flung the sun and the moon and the stars into the heavens. He's the one who established that. And the scriptures tell us God is light and there is no darkness that can be found in him. So for us to think that he would bring evil upon us, and accomplish that in our life, we need to understand that's against the very nature of who God is. He's the Father of all lights. And He is our Lord, and in Him there is no darkness. But not only that, that we look at His character, we also see this idea that He never changes. God's love for you never slows down. It continues to flow overboard toward us. His goodness and his loving kindness will follow us all the days of our life. And the evil one will try every single moment of your day to try to tell you, no, that that is not true, but we need to look back to the character of God when the evil one speaks into our mind. And we understand that we change. I can be good to my children today and evil to my children tomorrow. I can flap like a flag in the wind. Wherever the wind blows, I will go. And the scriptures remind us that that's what it's like to be a a created being of God, a creature of God. But the creator is not that way. James wants you to understand him. In him, his goodness is resolute. And his love for his created beings, just as we talked about the structure last week of how we can look at life, God, the creator, then we see the fall, then we see redemption, and then we see restoration. That's what the Lord is doing in this world. He is the creator and we are the created beings. And so when we understand that distance between us and God, we understand, yes, we change, but we have a heavenly father that does not. We have a heavenly father that is the same today yesterday and tomorrow. And God does not toy with his people. He does not bring cruelty to his church. God sees you as the apple of his eye, the delight of his creation. And you are his love and his delight, and he's proven that over and over again in the sending of his son. And so if that's still not good enough, you need to understand that even though we change, God does not. But you also need to understand this. James gives us another reason to bask in God's goodness. It's because of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. What he's saying there is, God is the author of your salvation. He's the one who's claimed you. He's the one that's brought you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And now you reside in the light of God and you enjoy him forever and you have the hope of the world to come that you will be there and enjoy him forevermore. 
And so it's our duty and our joy to glorify God in our lives here on earth and we'll do the same in heaven forevermore. But James wants you to understand that he's the author of your salvation. He's the one who has brought you into new life. He gave you the new life in Jesus Christ and James makes it very clear here in verse 18. He brought us forth by the word of truth and the word of truth that he's referring to is the gospel news. The good news that's found in Jesus Christ that he is the one who could do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that should be for the purpose that we'd be the first fruits of his creatures. So again, back to last week, what was I saying? You are the delight of God, so you're the first fruits of his creation. He enjoys you, he loves you in such a way. So let me give you some illustrations about how this can apply to your life. You've heard me talk about Johnny Erickson Tata many times, so I'm gonna read a little statement about her journey. She was a girl at the age of 16. She dove off a dock when she was at that teenage years and it was shallow water and she broke her neck. She was paralyzed and she wrote a book about her life. Her first book was called Johnny and she wrote about this in her story. She said, once again, I desperately wanted to kill myself. Here I was trapped in this canvas cocoon. I couldn't move anything except my head. Physically, I was a little more than a corpse. I had no hope of ever walking again. I had absolutely no idea of how I could find purpose or meaning in just existing day after day, walking, eating, watching TV, and sleeping. Why on earth should a person be forced to live out such a dreary existence? how I prayed from, for some accident or a miracle to kill me. The mental and spiritual anguish was unbearable as the physical torture. That's what she wrote in her first book, and she's describing how she went through the experience and was relating that to the Lord. In her second book, she comments about what, she just, what I just read to you, and her second book was called A Step Further. She said this, as I sit on our porch balcony overlooking the surrounding hills of our horse farm and take in all the smells and sounds of this pretty summer day, it's hard to believe I ever had thoughts like that. In fact, I almost can't remember what feeling that way was like. Oh, I'm still paralyzed. I still can't walk, still need to be bathed and dressed, but I'm no longer depressed. And to be honest, I can even say that I'm actually glad for the things which have happened to me. She began to hunt for the good. Glad? How can that be? What has made the difference? My artwork, and she is an artist by putting a brush in her mouth, and then using it to paint paintings. And if you've never seen them, I would encourage you to look at them on the internet. My artwork and my support of family and friends helped me pull out of my depression. But the heartfelt gratitude I have for this life in a wheelchair could have only have come from God and his word. They helped me piece together some of the puzzle, which was so confusing. It took some seeking and studying, but today as I look back, I'm convinced that the whole ordeal of my paralysis was inspired by his love. I wasn't a rat in a maze. I wasn't the brunt of some cruel divine joke. God had reasons behind my suffering, and learning some of them has made all the difference in the world. And he has reasons for your suffering too. I've had the opportunity to meet Johnny Erickson Tata several times, and it's one of a true faith, not the fake faith that I saw sometimes on the Christian campuses that I experienced, but one who came through the trials and the tribulations and was able to understand the goodness of God and to trust in his character, to trust in what he was doing on his behalf. And may that be your joy this morning as you begin to see how you can piece this together. You may not always get all the answers to your whys but you will always know this, that God is always good. And you may have to remind yourself of that over and over again because we need to rely on the character of God, his holiness, his perfection, his goodness to his created beings. Remember, you are the apple of his eye. 
John Stott said this when he spoke about the cross of Christ. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe is in is the one who Nietzsche ridiculed as the God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. And in imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. That's the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death, and he suffered for us. He suffered for me. Our sufferings became more manageable in light of this. There is still a question mark over human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross which symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in a world such as ours. Brothers and sisters, if you don't believe God can understand what's happening in your life, look to the cross and see your Savior there. He is not foreign to suffering. He suffered for you and for me to have eternal life. May that be your hope and your encouragement this morning to remember the goodness of God and the extent of his goodness was sending his son to die for us. Let's pray.